Good morning, John Warner. It is so good to see you again. Um, thanks for joining us all the way from Austin, Texas this morning. Right. Well, you have certainly uh, been a, a major presence in, in, in my life here at the UU Church, and I know in the life of so many others. You have been a transformative uh, presence, you know, for our church. And I believe you've also been transformed in, in your own way, uh, being a part of our church. So I just would love to uh, get a sense from you, you know, where were some of the, the wounds that you carried before you came to the church? Uh, in other words, uh, what healing do you feel needed to happen in your life? Well, I, I came out of an evangelical family in, in Iowa. And it was huge, had a long history of evangelism and mission work and preaching. Uh, my dad left there and went to Ohio, which was the heathen East from my family's point of view. And um, but what it did was it opened up the floodgates for our family and our children, the children in our family to um, to learn and see things in a very different way. Basically, that was the, the trigger for the things that I ended up doing. Uh, spent a year in seminary, and then I went off and got a PhD in physics and astronomy because I love the sense of you know how you look at science and religion uh, from different points of view. And so I basically spent my life thinking about science and religion. We ended up in Warner, New Hampshire about 20 years ago, and then I ran into Fred Creed. I think it was at Fall Foliage where he was selling honey. <laughs> and uh, after our conversations, invited me to come to the UU Church of Concord and see what was going on. I certainly remember Fred. Um, so, but tell me a little bit more about what what sort of was hurting within, or what longed for healing as a result of your journey to this point. Well, I'd been unchurched for 30 years, and so wrestling with it myself, um, other than the 50-year conversation with my dad <laughs> on religion, where I came from sort of created this underlying tension, you know, that had unanswered questions, just tons and tons of unanswered questions, and then you throw science in it, and you get a lot more unanswered questions. <laughs> so I was looking for a place of healing and renewal, of some sort and somewhere I could explore, perhaps not just within my own mind, some of these kinds of questions. I slowly began to realize that this place was a very open, accepting, supportive kind of a place that I eventually called my sanctuary. Mm -hmm. It was a safe place. But the things that cause the tension are from the evangelical side, it's this is the way, this is what you believe, this is how you understand. Um, this is what happens if you don't, um, you know, and it's just rigid, rigid, rigid. And all my years of thinking about the question concluded that, hey, it really wasn't very rigid. In fact, it was wide open, and we all had this not only opportunity, but obligation to make up our own minds about those things. So it's that underlying tension that is what I came in with. And it's not what I went out with. So what happened when you uh, accepted that invitation by Fred Creed? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess in, the, in a, the shortest version is that what happened was Reverend Marcel Duhamel. He, he was uh, what I would sort of call a kind of a terse, beneficial, supportive person. <laughs> it's not like he spent long hours arguing things or whatever. He just said, John, go read this book, you know? So the first one he gave me was by Marcus Borg called Reading the Bible Again for the First Time. Mm. And it was uh, subtitled Taking the Bible Seriously but Not Literally, and that piqued my interest. That was the beginning. It kind of enlarged my perspective on Christianity. Um, I found that people in the church were open to those discussions and they were wrestling with some of the same sorts of issues. It, it, the book itself, with its approach enabled me to kind of think bigger than where I came from. It ultimately led me uh, to what I would sort of summarize as three areas that were very, very beneficial. 
The first was the benefits of meditation and sort of being in the moment. And we all know where that comes from, Margaret Fletcher. Um, then ultimately also um, in reading another book that came out of that was the sort of the unifying force of the Beatitudes as an ethical base. It's commonly accepted, et cetera. And I even have it in common with my rather strict uh, evangelical friends today. <laughs> And the last thing, which in some ways was the most important, was the importance of listening as a way of accepting and honoring um, the worth and dignity of every human being, which is what we all accept within the UU Church. All that got initiated by Marcel, and it's been kind of growing and developing and maturing ever since. Um, and it ended up leading to a lot of interesting things that we did over the last 20 years. So how would you describe what what you just mentioned really helping to deal with that tension that you described earlier, the, the wounds that you were carrying? Well, um, for me, again, they, they provided, maybe I'll call it a set of tools and some satisfaction mm -hmm. with their use. Um, Margaret's uh, MBSR course, you know, gave me a tool to explore the mind. Uh, this has led gradually and very slowly to the experience of, you know, recognizing when you're living in the moment and when you're not, um, recognizing all the sources of suffering in your life and recognizing that you can make a decision not to do that. <laughs> and it doesn't matter that, you know, we suffer in a lot of ways. That's, I mean, that things go wrong, that things are impermanent and all. It's just that. It's the way we deal with them. And so that just has made a huge difference in my life. From the Beatitudes standpoint, the, the book that I found that was so useful is called The Five Gospels. And it's a group who were trying to r recognize the authentic words of Jesus, as opposed to, again, like where I came from, it says, you know, it says this word on that page, and that's, you know, that comes from God, and that's it. Thank you. And what that did was really it led to my focus on the Beatitudes. And I call the Beatitudes the B-attitude. So it's the attitude that you should be. Nice. Um, and there are many people who, who, who support this in a broad, you know, a broad way. And that actually led to some courses that we did. And that was a lot of fun. And then I think the thing that's in some ways had the most influence on me and, 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 and dogs me today is the work we did on reflective listening and restorative circles. I mean, our church had, you know, some, some history of not supporting uh, our ministers long term and uh, having a lot of internal strife that sometimes led to those things. And, um, you know, we're, we're all happy to have you in year 10 or is it 11? I don't know. Which 11 now, yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. You, put all these things together and, you know, I, I am grateful to have some measure of confidence in my old age, you know, about a lot of different things. And I no longer argue in my mind about science and religion. They've sorted out for me. Um, so I'm a happy guy. Beautiful. So what about, you know, Unitarian Universalism do you think is particularly conducive to healing to resolving some of these tensions or what would you point to in the UU faith uh, approach, you know, to, to religion that makes healing possible and, and maybe even likely? So I would give that a, a hard yes and a soft no. Okay. Um, the hard yes is that um, the openness, the diversity, you will always find somebody, you know, in the church who is like you, if you work at it. Um, the general openness and accepting of the church that allows for so many different varieties of spiritual activities, that allows for um, as much non-judgment as we can muster <clears throat> about what others think and even outside of the church. There is a thing, though, and particularly living in Texas, and what you realize in the kind of looking back is that, you know, there just aren't a whole lot of conservatives in the UU church. It's a kind of a curiosity, but also I think that in, this is the soft weakness, which is that we're, 
exceptionally liberal. You know, we like to be activists and um, we see that as a plus and an obligation to do it. On the other hand, you know, just look at the count. There's 70 million people out there who have voted for somebody that the other 80 million think is a nut job. How do we somehow, you know, implement our first principle with everybody? You know, how do we be open and accepting with everybody? I've been working with a conservative evangelical that lives in our town in Warner. And um, it's, it's a struggle. It's a complete struggle. On the other hand, I am convinced that, you know, his wants and needs and my wants and needs are very, very similar. And that somehow the translation is different. And that if we can accept the similarities, that we can figure out how to get along. And, you know, that's the main, main message that's come out of the whole restorative circle and, and that business. Because... It lets you know what other people think. You accept that they think that way. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with them. And so somewhere in there is something that somehow all these people need to get to work on. Because otherwise, I think the future could be a little grim. So, Sounds like more healing is necessary and thank you so much john for for your reflections here on your personal story and 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 the larger reflection on on our faith uh, tradition I, I so appreciate you know what you've brought uh, to our church of course and what i know you will continue to bring to the world thank you